years ago, I first heard the story told by a pastor of a soldier who had returned to Great Britain after a war. I don't know what war it was exactly, but it was a soldier who had been injured during the course of duty, and as a result of his injury, he lost his sight and was blind. Now this soldier was a rather accomplished musician, and he had great skills, at least as far as I know, as far as playing the piano. And after he had recovered, he decided to play the piano at the hospital where he recovered in the hope of cheering other injured soldiers. So day after day he played, and he didn't know whether his playing was really making a difference, but nonetheless he did it. And he played as best he could in the hopes of cheering the soldiers who were there. Then one day, after he had finished, he heard clapping not too far off from where he was playing, sitting. And so he asked the question, and who might you be? And a voice responded, a rather robust voice, saying, I am your king. It was the king of England, who was there visiting some of the soldiers who had been wounded. I share that story because this man was playing, and as he was playing on that day, he had no idea who was right alongside of him. Even as he was going through the motions of everyday life for him at that point, which involved playing in the hopes of cheering up the other soldiers who were wounded and in the hospital, there right next to him was the king. But he didn't know it until the king, if you will, revealed himself to him. There's something like that, you could say, happening in our text there are two disciples who are engaged in the normal process of traveling from one city to another. And then they engage in a rather normal process of speaking with a stranger along the way. But little do they know as they speak to this stranger that they're actually speaking to their king. It's an amazing text. Amazing. Ironically, as you're going to see, their temporary blindness was sovereignly superintended to help them see what they had previously failed to see. But you'll see that, Lord willing, at the end of the message. Now, the account of the road to Emmaus is often referred to as one of the most beloved of the post-resurrection accounts of Jesus. The commentator Frederick Godet calls it, quote, one of the most admirable pieces in St. Luke's Gospel. Now, furthermore, this is unique to Luke's Gospel. If you want to see the Road to Emmaus account, this is where you have to go because it's not recorded anywhere else. Dean Plumtree says, quote, It must be looked upon as among the gleaning of the grapes, which rewards his researches even after the full vintage had apparently been gathered in by others. In other words... Luke, who at the beginning of this gospel said that he was diligent to carefully investigate everything that he had heard, and he carefully investigated eyewitnesses in the course of his superintended by the Holy Spirit investigation, he came across an account that otherwise we wouldn't know about. So as he gleaned the grapes, even as Matthew and Mark's gospel presumably were already around in circulation, God the Holy Spirit uses Luke's investigation to include this precious account of two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I agree with Daryl Bach's assessment when he wrote, quote, Part of what makes it such an enjoyable story is that the reader knows more about what is taking place than the two disciples who unknowingly encounter Jesus, end quote. So embrace that. As we walk through this study today, that's one of the privileges that you have, if you will, as the reader. You know what the two disciples in this account do not know, at least until they know it. So you get to know that they're talking with Jesus, whom they perceive to be a stranger. Well, given the fact that the opening verse will allow us to create some context, we'll jump right in. And we're going to begin at Luke chapter 24, verse 13, where we read, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So now the scene changes. Hence the opening phrase, now behold, an expression that Luke uses repeatedly to signify a narrative transition. So we as the readers, we are transitioning from seeing Peter, seeing what he saw in the empty tomb, the linen clothes that were just lying there, and now we're transitioning to behold two disciples who were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. At which point you could ask the question, well, how do we know that they are disciples? Well, the narrative is going to bear that out. But in the text, Luke clearly tells us that two of them, 
talks about two of them. And most immediately you say, okay, well, who is he most immediately talking about? The apostles and other disciples. If you look back at verse 9, you can see that the, when, when the women came back from the tomb and told all that happened to the eleven, they also told it to the rest of the disciples. And if you're wondering how they responded, these rest of the disciples, verse 11 gives you a clue. Just like the apostles, they probably perceived the words of the women to be idle tales. Remember what the women were coming back to tell these disciples, the eleven, and everyone else who was there? We've seen the risen Lord was probably part of it because we see in Matthew's gospel on the way back they encounter the risen Lord. But per Luke's gospel, we know that they saw two angels. They saw an empty tomb and the two angels gave them a very specific message to go and bring the disciples. But yet the apostles and those gathered regarded the report as a kind of delirium from women who were just upset and overtaken with grief. Now these two disciples here, we don't know too much about them. We know that one was named Cleopas. We find that out later. We find that out in verse 18. Guesses abound as to who the other was. The other disciple, as you'll see in the passage, is unnamed. Some contend that it was Cleopas' wife, which is a possibility. Cleopas is named here. Maybe the other disciple is his wife. Others contend that the Cleopas who's mentioned here is actually the Clopas of John chapter 19 verse 25 and the difference in spelling is attributed to a variant spelling of the same name which would make the wife, if this was Clopas, Mary who's also mentioned in that John passage. Some follow the Byzantine tradition and they say we think that it's actually Luke and that Luke out of modesty did not record his name as being the other disciple. And then some still say that it was Alphaeus, the father of the apostle James. The early church historian Eusebius, he suggests that the unnamed disciple was Simeon, the son of Clopas, who was elected the leader of the Jerusalem church after James, the half-brother of Jesus, was martyred. So you can see we don't know who this is. <laughs> we have a lot of options that are on the table, and maybe, maybe we can rule out some of those options, because we know that the two of them included a man by the name of Cleopas. So then that would likely, perhaps, exclude this, the other disciple from being one of the twelve apostles. So these are two of not the remaining eleven apostles. Likely part of the seventy. If not, definitely part of the hundred and twenty, I would suggest. So we don't know. As far as it being Luke, well we do see Luke distinguish himself in the opening verses of Luke's gospel from other eyewitnesses. So that perhaps, perhaps rules him out, but we don't know. At the end of the day, we don't know who this other disciple was. But we do know that the Holy Spirit had good reason for superintending the narrative the way that he did. And one of these, whether it was Cleopas or whether it was the other disciple, was likely Luke's source of this account. Because remember, Luke is using eyewitness testimony. Well, that's some of what we do know and some of what we don't know about these disciples. Next, we're going to ask, still on verse 13, what were they doing? We are told that they were, quote, traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So first notice the important chronological note. This is happening the same day. Probably a little bit later on in the day, given the fact that the women had traveled to the tomb very early in the morning and had come back and had brought a report to the disciples and the eleven apostles. So it's probably happening a little bit later on in the day. It's the first day of the week. It's the day of the resurrection. That's when these people are traveling. And we can also see that they're traveling to a place called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. Why are they going there? Again, we're not told exactly, but the most likely reason I would suggest is that they were traveling back home after the celebration of the Passover, having waited till the third day, though as I'm going to suggest, not waiting long enough on the third day. Some suggest they were going to visit family and friends. Maybe that's a possibility, but I think the former is more likely. As far as Emmaus, this is what we know about it. We don't know its present location, but we do know it was seven miles away from Jerusalem. And you could peruse the multitude of suggestions that are made by commentators, because there are many in regards to where this place actually was. The most likely consensus that I see is that it was the same place that was referred to in the writing of Josephus's The Jewish Wars. But nonetheless, we know it was seven miles away from Jerusalem. There they are. That's the setting. 
And the setting is developed a little bit more in the following verse. Verse 14 tells us, And they talked together of all these things which had happened, which makes all the sense in the world. How could they not be talking about those things? Notice what Luke tells us. You're going to see that word all a lot in this passage. They talked together of all these things which had happened. So what were they talking about? Well, most immediately, we're going to find out even later on, they're talking about what happened that day. They're talking about the women coming back from the tomb and bringing the report that they did. They're talking about the tomb being empty. They're talking about the report that Peter and John brought back, seeing the grave clothes and seeing them lying in the way that they were lying. They were definitely talking about that. But I don't think they were just talking about that. I think they were definitely talking about that. But when you see Jesus ask a question a little bit later on, like, what are you talking about? They're going to say a lot about who Jesus was. They're going to talk about what happened to Jesus, how he was condemned to death by the chief priests and the religious leaders. So probably they're also talking about what happened that week. Trying to put it together. Like we saw what happened when he came into Jerusalem. We saw the people saying, Hosanna, son of David. We saw Jesus teaching in the temple. And then we saw him crucified. How does that fit together? I didn't see that coming. But we saw the amazing things that happened that surrounded the crucifixion. We saw the earthquake happen. Or at least we felt the earthquake happen. We've heard these things. We saw Jesus say words on the cross that no other man would say. But he's talking to his father in this way in fulfillment of the scriptures. How does this all fit together? But it's Sunday. It's the first day of the week and we still haven't seen him. They're talking about all these things, I think, trying to fit it together. And I would suggest, as we're going to see as we get into verses 15 to 16, there may be a little bit of a debate happening between these men. A little bit of a back and forth because they don't have the same position in trying to understand these things. That's rather interesting. You can imagine one saying, you know, do you really think it happened the way that the women told us? Like that there were angels at the tomb like saying what they said and bringing a message for the disciples and the other one saying, no, come on. You really think that happened? Did you see all the look, the look in their faces? They looked crazy. They looked like they, like they were out of their minds. And they're like, I don't know, but they were right about some things. No, 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 what are you talking about? So who knows? There may be a little bit of a batting back and forth. You're going to see that as we get into verses 15 and 16 where we read, So it was... While they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. The first thing that I want to call your attention to is the phrase used to describe what these two disciples were doing. It was while they conversed and reasoned with one another that Jesus drew near and went with them. Now the expositor's Greek Testament commentary suggests that the inclusion of the word in your translation and mine right here for reasoned, suzateo, with the word that is before it for conversed, homileo, suggests, quote, lively discussion, perhaps accompanied by some heat. That's how he put it. Now the word for conversed, homileo, just means talk, converse with, speak back and forth, homileo. But the word suzateo, has a connotation often associated with it that suggests, at least per Strong's concordance, that these men were in some kind of dispute. It could mean, quote, seek together, discuss, or dispute. Now that word suzateo, in your translation and mine, reasoned, is used ten times in the New Testament. And it sometimes has that kind of connotation with it. For example... In Mark chapter 8, verse 11, the Pharisees disputed, same word, disputed with Jesus seeking a sign from heaven. In Mark chapter 8, verse 11, we see that sign. In Mark chapter 9, verse 14, we see the scribes disputing with some of the apostles at the bottom of the Mount of Transfiguration. Interestingly, this word is also used in Mark's gospel, a little bit before that, Mark chapter 9, verse 10. When Jesus told the apostles who were with him, James, John, and Peter, when they were up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, don't tell anybody about what you saw, basically here on the Mount, don't tell anybody what you saw until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Then according to verse 10, they began to dispute with each other about what did he mean by that. Because they didn't have a connotation for Jesus dying no matter how many times he told them. So these disciples were apparently engaged in some kind of back and forth discussion. And ironically, neither party 
had a good grasp of what was going on. Let's just observe that. So, so in, in a certain sense, it's probably precious to the Lord that there they are talking about Jesus because that's a good thing. It's a good thing when people are talking about Jesus, but it's not a good thing when people are talking about Jesus and don't have a proper understanding of what Jesus did. So both of these men are lacking a proper understanding of Jesus, but that's going to change because we're told, second half of verse 15, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Concerning the last verb in that sentence, went, Marvin Vincent wrote, quote, The use of the imperfect tense here is very beautiful. Jesus drew near while they were absorbed in their talk and was already walking with them when they observed him. Now remember, at this point, the disciples do not know that it's Jesus who's drawn near to them and is about to speak with them. Now to us, this might seem a little bit strange. Because usually if we're getting from place to place, we're either driving in our cars or we're taking public transportation, and we usually don't engage in long extended conversations with strangers when we travel. Right? You're not in your car driving down Highland Boulevard or on the West Shore Expressway with your window open talking to the motorist who's right alongside of you. You just don't do that. And if you do do that, you need to stop doing it right away. <laughs> Nor... If you're on the bus or the train, occasionally you may talk with somebody who's sitting next to you and get into a conversation, hopefully an evangelistic conversation or among other topics as well. But usually, you're not usually riding home on the express bus or driving or sitting on a bus or sitting on a train, getting into long-extending conversations with people. But in first century Judea, when you were traveling, walking for miles from one place to another, it wouldn't be uncommon to get into long conversations with strangers along the way. And that's what happened for Cleopas and this other disciple. And I just want to stop right here to say how amazing I think that is. That is incredible to me. They were walking together. They're talking about the Lord. And little do they know who shows up. The Lord. Jesus. But they don't recognize Him. And even as they're talking about the Lord Jesus, they likely thought that He was a far off and far away, yet He was so very near. And so often, I think that is paradigmatic of the life of disciples, both in the canon of Scripture and post the completion of the canon of Scripture. We see in the book of Genesis, for example, in Genesis 28, verse 16, Jacob says, Surely the presence of Yahweh was in this place, and I did not know it. Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, didn't know how close the Lord was to him, nor did he know the meaning of the burning bush until he did. Amen. It's like Mary Magdalene who's weeping outside of the tomb. And she sees someone whom she perceived to be the gardener. And she's weeping because she thinks somebody has removed her Lord and Jesus is far away, yet Jesus is right next to her. And I think this is so paradigmatic of our walks with Jesus oftentimes. We're inclined to think that God is distant. Maybe even, erroneously, absent. Not realizing how very close He is and imminent. We might be inclined to say, like the psalmist said in Psalm 10, Why, Lord, do you stand afar off? Not realizing that he is walking right alongside. You could say that the unique experience of these men on the road to Emmaus is paradigmatic of the everyday reality for New Testament Christians. Jesus walks with you. When you know it, and even when you don't, Everywhere you go, if you are a Christian, if you're somebody who has repented of your sins and you've placed your trust alone in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins, if you are such a person, you could say, similar to what Jacob said, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place and I know it. And you know that the Lord never leaves you or forsakes you because He's committed to be with you and He's given His Spirit to dwell inside of you. So it was a unique experience, and it was a unique experience in the history of Scripture for these men to be walking alongside of Jesus. But if you are a Christian, it's your everyday reality, because He dwells in you. You walk with Him. You can't escape Him. It's like what David said in Psalm 139, like, where can I go from your spirit? Now we get to say that in a personal, relational way. There's nowhere I can go to escape you. 
You're my God. You've changed my heart. I'm clinging to you. I'm one with you. He who is joined to the Lord is one in spirit with the Lord. And that should never be a license for sin. No. Seeing that God is working in you both to will and to do His good pleasure should spur you on to work out the salvation that He's embedded in your heart with holy fear and trembling because God is in you. Amen. So everywhere you go, He goes. Amen. That's an amazing, precious reality. Whether you know it or you don't, he's there. Now, why weren't they aware of it? Why didn't they know? These disciples had been walking alongside of Jesus, but they did not recognize him. We'll, we'll talk about why they didn't in a moment, but first let's just say what this reminds us of. It's a reminder of the obvious truth that Jesus was human, and he looked human. Now, doubtless, his glorified body had the capacity to radiate with resplendent light, the likes of which will fill up heaven, Revelation 21, 23. But at this point, he looked like just another man walking down the road. Right? He wasn't glowing at this point. Otherwise, everybody on the road would be like, what in the world is that? <laughs> He looked normal, like a normal human being. It reminds us of the continuity of our resurrected bodies. There's a level of continuity. It's still a human body that looks like a human body when we're resurrected from the dead, Jesus being the first fruits of those resurrected from the dead. Granted, as we've spoken about before, there are elements of discontinuity. Jesus' body appears to be able to do things that our bodies right now are not able to do, and Lord willing, we'll get to find out. All of us in this room, everyone who's come to faith in Christ Jesus, we'll get to see what those glorified bodies can do when the day of the resurrection comes. But there's elements of continuity and discontinuity. One of the elements of continuity is that he looked human. But as far as why they didn't recognize him, we're plainly told, this is what we're told, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now Luke doesn't tell us what was restraining their eyes. Some suggest it was grief. Some suggest it was sorrow. Some suggest it was ignorance. I'm inclined to believe that it was the result of supernatural control, to use language from the commentator Ellicott, because the verb that's used here is in the passive voice, which suggests that, to use the language of this verb itself, that their eyes were held, and it's in the passive voice, which suggests that somebody was doing it. And I'm saying that I think, when you look at the post-resurrection accounts of Jesus, there appears to be a sense in which his identity is recognized at His pleasure. The pleasure of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now somebody might say at this point, they might say, well, wait a minute, what about Mark 16, 12? Because Mark 16, 12 tells us that after that, He appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, which seems to be a reference to the road to Emmaus. Now as we've spoken about before on other occasions, it looks like the closing verses of Mark's Gospel, particularly verse 9 through 20, as you probably see in footnotes in many of your Bibles and bracketed in other Bibles, was not a part of Luke's original manuscript, Mark's original manuscript. Therefore, to use that and to interpret what's happening in Luke's Gospel in light of that, not the best way to go, because it does not appear to be a part of Mark's original autograph. But we are plainly told their eyes were restrained. And I think what we have happening here is reminiscent of what Jesus said in Luke 10, 22, When he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And who the Father is except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So I think what we have happening here is paradigmatic of salvation. That in Jesus' resurrection accounts, resurrection accounts, His identity is revealed at His pleasure. Which, by the way, is a doctrine that explains how you got saved, if you are a Christian. Because the identity of who Jesus is was revealed to you by God. In the fullness of time, it was the Spirit of God who opened your eyes to the Son of God so you could see that all the promises of redemption and salvation are to be found in Him, Jesus Christ. So I do think what's happening here in the resurrection accounts is paradigmatic of what happens in the salvation of people. 
Well, there appears to have been a very important reason for this, by the way. Their identity is being withheld. The identity of Jesus is being withheld at this point, and I think it's for a very, very, very important reason. But I'm not going to share it yet. We're going to see when we get to the end of our message this morning. But right now, we're going to see how Jesus enters the conversation with these disciples. Verse 17 reads, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? So now the implication is that Jesus has been walking with them, hearing a little bit of the exchange. We're not sure how much of the exchange, but he's walking with them. And then he asks, asks them the question in our text. Now, clearly, if there's anybody who knew the answer to this, it was Jesus. He knew what was going on, but he's engaging in a conversation with them. I liken it to him as a kind of soul doctor, if you will. He's getting them to speak, and they're going to share, not realizing it. They just think they're sharing history and they're sharing fact of what they were speaking about, but they're actually showing the symptoms of their problem. As they speak, and Jesus is going to provide the remedy to the problem by the end of our passage today, we're going to see that. Now again, there's a couple words in the sentence I want to, in this verse that I should draw your attention to. The first one is conversation. Jesus said, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another? It's the Greek word antibalo. Antibalo, and it means to throw at opposition, throw at in opposition, or to exchange words. So it can simply mean conversation, but again, this might be another hint that they're debating, they're talking about something in a kind of throwing, throwing a conversation back and forth kind of way. But then Jesus also used the word that we see here, sad. Skythropoi, it's used two times in the New Testament. The other time it's used is Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, and per Strong's Concordance, it means, quote, gloomy, sad, countenanced, close quote. But there's a part of this that I think, as you see in maybe some of your translations, but is caught in the oldest manuscripts that we have, that the latter part of the verse actually reads like this. Jesus asks the question, and then we're told, and they stood still, looking sad. There's two things I want us to notice about that. They're walking on the road to Emmaus. Now, according to the oldest manuscripts, it looks like they're saying, it looks like it said, they stood still, looking sad. So the first thing I want you to imagine, see the picture painted before your eyes. They're walking down the road, they're talking about these things, and then there's a stranger, perceived stranger, who's walking with them, obviously is hearing some of what they're saying, and asks, what kind of conversation is this? Like, basically, what are you guys talking about? Fill me in. And it's like they stop in their tracks. They stood still. And they look at the stranger. And you're going to see what they say in a minute. But I just love that picture and the way it just fills in the context a little bit. But notice that we're told that they were looking sad. And again, again, so paradigmatic of our Christian lives oftentimes that we're sad when we don't need to be. When there's no reason to be. We worry when we don't need to worry. We're sad when we don't need to be sad. Granted, there's times when sadness is appropriate and heaviness of heart is appropriate. Of course, we see that in the Psalter. We see that in other places as well. But so often in our Christian lives, we're sad when we don't need to be. We worry when we don't need to worry. And it's paradigmatic of what's happening right here. They're sad. Because they think Jesus is afar off. They think all the promises that they were hoping were going to be fulfilled in him are not fulfilled in him. Yet he's right there. They have no reason to be sad. So check with yourself when you get sad through the lens of Scripture and see whether or not you actually think you have a biblical warrant for sadness and heaviness of heart. You need to put on the lenses of Scripture. Let me tell you, as somebody who lacks good vision without these glasses on, right? I take these glasses off, and right now I can't even make you guys out. You guys look like colors, kind of, you know, put together, like blurry. But when I put these glasses on, there you are. I can see you very clearly. It's like that when it comes to life on this earth, seeing things through the lens of Scripture. If you don't see things through the lens of Scripture, things are going to be confused to your sight. But if you put on the lens of Scripture and you say, I want to see these things through the lens of Scripture, it's going to be clear. Sometimes it's still going to be hard. It doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. But nonetheless, you'll see rightly. And you won't have to think something's hard when it's not or think something should cause you to be sad when it shouldn't. Well, they stopped short. They looked at Jesus with a sense of shock and sadness. And you can see why they were shocked in the next verse. Verse 18 reads, Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, 
Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Now again, notice the irony. You as the reader get to appreciate this. If there's anybody who knew what happened in Jerusalem in those days, it was Jesus. So as a reader, you get to enjoy some of that. Luke is teaching you here as you're getting to read the account from the reader's perspective, knowing what these disciples do not know. He definitely knew what happened, but they didn't know that he knew what happened, at least not yet. So Cleopas voices what the other disciple was obviously thinking as well, that it's basically inexplicable. The whole city has been talking about this man. The whole city has been talking about Jesus and what happened. And possibly even word had gotten around a little bit about what happened in the morning, at least in their sphere of influence. It was inexplicable to them. Amazing. It was as the Apostle Paul told King Agrippa when he said to King Agrippa after recounting his conversion and speaking about Jesus, he said, quote, For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. Acts 26, verse 26. In other words, everybody knows about this. How do you, stranger, not know about this? But they went on to answer. And they said, and this is verses 19 through 21, and he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So Jesus' question, verse 19, what things would reveal even more of A, what these disciples believed, B, how they felt, and then C, the events of the day. Now first we see where the disciples landed in their estimation of Jesus. If you want to see the conclusion that they drew, at least at this point in time, they said that he was, quote, a prophet, mighty in deed, and word, before God and all the people. Now this statement tells you quite a bit of how they perceived Jesus and tells you a lot about Jesus. They esteemed him, they considered that he was a prophet. And he was a prophet. He was the promised prophet that Moses had spoken about, and Lord willing, we're going to talk about that next week. He was that prophet. But he was at the same time more than a prophet. He was one who did indeed speak the very words of God. And he came as a spokesman of the Father. Remember in John chapter 7 verse 16, Jesus said, My teaching is not mine, but is his who sent me. And then in John chapter 12 verse 49, Jesus said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as what to say and what to speak. So Jesus was the ultimate prophet. He spoke everything that the Father had given him to speak, but he was the ultimate prophet in this sense. He not only spoke the revelation of God, he himself was the revelation of God. No other prophet could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But Jesus was the Word made flesh. He was the express image of God's person. And the fullness of the deity dwelled in him in bodily form. So Jesus was a prophet, yes. Spoke the very words of God. But he was more than a prophet and the ultimate prophet. They also bear witness of how he was mighty indeed. I love that. I love the passing comments to the powerful works that Jesus wrought. Mighty indeed. And I would say he's mighty indeed. He was that. He did incredible miracles. He turned water into wine. He healed the sick. While in Cana of Galilee, he was able to heal the son of a royal official that laid sick in Capernaum. Gather that. To be standing in one place and to say somebody has been healed in another place and you are the one who is begetting that. Amazing. While Peter and Andrew had Jesus and others over their home. It was there that Jesus rebuked a fever from Peter's mother-in-law. He healed lepers. He healed paralytics. 
He healed the mute. He healed the deaf. He healed the blind. He can cast out demons. Whether somebody was bound by few or by many, didn't matter. It was all equally easy to him. He could calm a storm with his words. He could feed 5,000 or 4,000 with just a small amount of food. He could walk on water. He could cause a fig tree to wither with his word. And he could even put a severed ear back on a man who had just lost it. He was mighty in deed. And he also said he was mighty in word. In other words, both what he taught and how he taught bore witness that he was a spokesman of God. Concerning how he taught... When he taught in the synagogue at Capernaum on the Sabbath, the people were, quote, astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Mark chapter 1, verse 22. Even the officers of the chief priests, when they were sent to go get Jesus, they come back and they say, no man ever spoke like this man. And you remember when we were studying Jesus in the last week of his life, speaking in the temple, the way that the religious leaders kept trying to trap him. And you saw the infinite wisdom that was on display in the way that he responded to them. The Pharisees marveled at how Jesus answered their question about Caesar and taxes. And as a result, they kept quiet. Luke chapter 20, verse 26. So even the Pharisees are marveling. And keeping quiet. Even the scribes, when they saw how Jesus answered the resurrection question of the Sadducees, you might remember this from Luke 20, verse 39, they said, Teacher, you have spoken well. He was mighty in word with the authority with which he spoke and the things that he said. He was mighty in word. But there's another important portion of their statement that's important to notice. He was mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people. Now, the fact that they say he was mighty in word and deed before God suggests that Jesus lived a life that was well-pleasing to God. Now, we don't know all of what these men knew, but we do know that the Father, at Jesus' baptism, said, This is my beloved Son in in whom I am well-pleased. He said similar words on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Father was well-pleased with the Son, Now, these disciples who were disappointed because they don't think Jesus was who they were hoping that he was, but nonetheless, they're bearing witness of the fact that they're saying, he was a righteous man. He he did things mighty in word and deed before God. When God saw him, God's approval was upon him. Peter even appeals to that in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, when he speaks about Jesus' life and miracles, and that through the miracles, the Father showed his approval of the Son. But the people also had a high view of Jesus. And you might lose sight of that given the fact that we just went through the resurrection where there was a crowd gathered who joined with the religious leaders saying, crucify him. But we shouldn't forget what had happened there earlier in the week that when Jesus was in the temple, after he had cleansed the temple, Mark tells us, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and they sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. The people were astonished. If you remember that last week in the temple, the people are coming and they're just marveling besides themselves at the teaching that they're hearing from Jesus. In Luke chapter 19, verse 48, we're told that the religious leaders were uh, were unable to do anything to Jesus, quote, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So although the crowd that surrounded Pilate and yelled crucify him on that day was indeed there that day, Jesus, like John the Baptist was well respected in the eyes of the people as a prophet of God. So even now, these disciples have a high estimation of Jesus, but it clearly wasn't high enough. (laughs) If you view Jesus as a prophet, but you don't view him as a Messiah, that Jesus that you view as a prophet can't save you. It's only the Jesus that is Messiah, who is the real Jesus, is the one who will save you from your sins. And there's no other option to be saved from your sins except through Him. So they had a high view, but it wasn't high enough. They failed to recognize Him as the Messiah. Now as the disciples are telling this account to this perceived stranger, 
If he was a stranger, which he was not, and if he didn't know what was going on, which he did, he would have been shocked by the next part of this. Having heard that, that he was a prophet, mighty in word and deed, then there's the unexpected twist, because they said, quote, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucify him. Now, if he was an uninformed stranger, that would be baffling. This one is that powerful, that mighty, that authoritative, yet he's killed by the religious leaders? And that is exactly what happened. Peter could say to the men of Israel, to the gathered crowd in Acts chapter 3, verse 12, could say to them, You delivered up Jesus and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So he could say that to the men of Israel, broadly speaking. But culpability rested most upon the religious leaders and the way they turned all the wheels of injustice to make sure that Jesus was crucified, which is why Peter would say to the Sanhedrin, quote, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Acts 4, verse 10. And likewise, in Acts chapter 5, verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Acts 5, 30. But in the next verse, we see where their assessment of Jesus descended from. Verse 21 reads, But we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, today is the third day since these things happened. So you look at the first half, or the very beginning of this verse in the first half, the we emphasizes the contrast. But we, not like the religious leaders, we were hoping, and the implication is we're not hoping that anymore, we were hoping that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. Like those in the early portion of Luke's gospel, you remember that Simeon was somebody who was led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he got to see the newborn king shortly before he died. But then when Anna the prophetess saw that, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, she saw what Simeon saw, and she probably heard what Simeon heard, then she would speak, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, to all who were there about the redemption of Jerusalem. Because they're looking at the Old Testament prophecies, and they're thinking the first coming is going to equal redemption of Jerusalem. He's going to establish the kingdom. That's what's going to happen. They didn't realize, at least many of them, if not most of them, I should say, that there was going to be a second coming. So they're hoping that he's going to do in his first coming what he's going to do in his second coming, and they're looking for a certain thing, and they're overlooking the big thing. They were hoping that he was going to bring redemption to Jerusalem in his first coming. But he brought redemption to sinners in his first coming. And that word that's used here, lutruo, is an incredible word. Redemption is used three times in the New Testament. Once is here. The other two times it's used to speak of the purchasing, the buying back that Jesus performed on the cross when he died in the stead of sinners like us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 reads, Knowing that you were not redeemed... With corruptible things, there's that word, redeemed, like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Likewise, the other time that word is used for redeemed, lutruo, is in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, where we're told that Jesus, quote, gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's a picture of the redemption you get to enjoy now. If you come to the cross by grace, through faith, you are bought out of the bondage of sin. And Jesus is the one who paid the price. He gave Himself. He offered up the shedding of His own blood. He gave His life to set you free. You celebrate that redemption. You celebrate that purchase in the very high cost that He was willing to pay, that the Father was willing to pay in giving His Son, that the Son was willing to pay in giving Himself. And then you see the life that befits the one who was bought 
The one who is bought was bought. Jesus gave himself, according to Titus 2.14, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. You see both the offense and the defense of sanctification, if you will, there. That we're to run away from lawless deeds because we were bought out of lawlessness. And we're to run in the path of good works. Not being saved by those good works, but walking in those good works which God prepared beforehand for us to do. Amazing. That's the redemption that we celebrate in this moment. So they were thinking what was going to happen at the second coming was going to happen at the first coming. And they missed it. And look at what they said after that. He said in the second half, verse 21, Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since all these things happened. You get what they're saying there? It's as though they're referencing now part of what the women had told them. Because remember, the women were bringing back a report from the angels saying what Jesus had said, that he was going to be crucified and he was going to be raised on the third day. And they're referencing the third day very specifically. Like they know the timetable. And even today is the third day. It's as though they're saying, and nothing's happened. But wait a minute. It's as though their memory gets jogged in this moment. But today is the third day. But now they're going to recall, well, you know what? Let me just tell you a little bit of what happened today. It's been a crazy morning, by the way. So they go on and they say in verses 22 through 24, Yes, remember this is the third day since this happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Now again, it's my opinion, my opinion, that as Cleopas was saying what he said in verse 21, he jogged his memory. And he remembered a little bit of what had happened earlier that morning on the third day. First, he told the perceived stranger that the women in their company astonished them. The idea of that Greek word, they were besides themselves. We were astonished when they came back and told us what they did. What did the women say? They said they went to the tomb. They said they didn't find the body there. They said that they had seen angels. And I'm guessing, in light of Matthew's gospel, that they saw the risen Christ on the way back, that they told them about that too. But then they also said, if you go on, in verse 23, they speak about how the men, those of their company, we know that as James and John, they went and they found it like the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. That's where they landed, basically. They landed saying, you know what, they may have seen the empty tomb, they may have seen everything else that, you know, that the women said was there, but they didn't see the angels, but they didn't see Jesus. So that's why we're on the road to Emmaus, and we are going home now. I think it's interesting. Because the women did get facts right. It wasn't like they were out of their mind, and the, and the disciples went back, Peter and John, to the rest of them and said, you know what, went there, I don't know what they were talking about, the tomb is sealed up, and actually there's even no linen clothes in there. But the women got facts right. And I think we have here another example of how we as fallen people could be so impatient. Think about what's happening right here. It's the third day. They just referenced it was the third day. Why not just stick it out till the end of the day? I don't know what was awaiting them in Emmaus. Now, maybe they had some pressing matters they had to get to. And if they did, fair enough. So I'm not casting aspersions on these men. But if this was a result of impatience, it's like you want to tell them, hang in there, wait till the day is over. He said on the third day, don't be like Saul who did not wait until the fulfillment of the seventh day, and Samuel said he would be back on the seventh day. He just didn't say whether it was going to be at the beginning or the end of it. But they were, like we are, I would guess, prone to impatience. And if you see that in yourself, if you see that you are prone to impatience, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your work, whether it's at your job, then you would do well to remember that a fruit of the Holy Spirit is not impatience, but it's patience. So when impatience rises up in you, that's a work of the flesh. When patience rises up from you, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. These men, I think, were impatient. They were probably thinking, if he was alive, we would have heard about it. After all, we're about more than halfway through the day. Yeah, but you're not through the day. You're not through the day. So they have some needs that need to be met. 
Now, this is where I want to close today, and this is so important. This is, so, this is going to be the segue into next week's message. This is critical. Jesus, at this point in time, you know what he could have done? He could have just told them, guys, problem solved. <laughs> it's me. I'm alive. And that would have solved their problems, right? So you think. But there's more going on here. And Jesus knows, no, no, the symptoms that you told me and what you were perceiving about me shows me that there's a bigger problem here. So Jesus is going to address them. And watch how he does, by the way. He doesn't say, yeah, I know this has been so hard for you guys. He doesn't do that. Watch what he does. Verses 25 through 27. Then he said to them, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, we're going to exposit, Lord willing, those verses at the beginning of the message next week. But I do want to call your attention to this. Jesus thought it was more important for these disciples to see what they failed to understand in his word than to see that he was resurrected at that moment. That's how important understanding the word of God is. He could have just said, it's me. But instead, he first wanted to take them to what they did not understand in the word of God. That's how important the study, the reading, the meditation, and most ultimately the understanding of the Word of God is. I don't know of a way Jesus could have drove that point home more. That's how important understanding the Bible is to Jesus. They needed to see what they had missed in the written Word before they were going to see the incarnate Word. And if there were ever a reason to say, we're going to continue this next Sunday and you want to be a part of studying this, that's it. Because we're going to get an idea of what Jesus expounded to them. But for this morning, we close. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the many ways in which you show us the primacy of your word in our need to delight in it, to ingest it, and to understand it. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that this Word is so profitable to us. It's spirit and life. It's living and active. Thank you that it corrects us, instructs us, and reproves us. Thank you for the doctrine that is contained there in it. Thank you, Father, for all the revelation of who your Son is your attributes and your character, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the preciousness and connectedness of the local church, the work of redemption, the work of glorification. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the precious truths contained in your word. And thank you for everything that we got to to study this morning. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that the passage that we have already begun to study would continue to inflame our hearts. We pray, Father, that there would be a sense of glorying in Jesus when we think about this passage. There would be a sense of appreciation as we consider what was a unique experience for them is, in a certain sense, our everyday reality. That you and your Son walk with us because your Spirit indwells us. Oh, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of studying it this morning. We pray that you would bear fruit through it. We trust that you will. In Jesus' name, amen.